Before we start with the discussion, I would like to introduce our two um, sort of additional uh, panelists. Now we have more microphones, that's great. Um, I'd like to introduce, first of all, Fabian Eckelhofer. Um, sitting on the right. Um, she has been appointed chief curator and head of the collection, exhibitions and research at the Centrum Paul Klee in Bern. From 2005 to 2017, she was curator for modern and contemporary art at the Centrum Paul Klee, where she has realized numerous exhi exhibitions as well as collection displays. Um, in 2012, she completed a research project on Paul Klee's teaching at the Bauhaus that culminated also on an online database. And I think this is really a quite um, important um, sort of contribution to all the researchers that are interested in Paul Klee, uh, specifically on Klee's um, teaching notes. Um, and also an exhibition, Paul Klee, Bauhaus Master at the Centrum Paul Klee. And then it was also traveling uh, to uh, Madrid in 2012 and uh, 2013. And uh, she was also heavily engaged in the sort of the realization of the Bauhaus Imaginista show, which is at the moment on show in Bern. So she co-curated also together with Marion von Ossen the show in Bern. Um, yeah, and I also wanted to introduce Patrick Rissler, uh, the only man in our female round. <laughs> um, so welcome. Um, Patrick Rissler is probably very known among all the audience. Uh, he is the chair and the professor for communication science and studies at the university in Erfurt. Um, she was engaged in a lot of uh, sort of international research projects, and I wanted to mention here only a few of them, like the research project on Bauhaus networks in exile, uh, which was from 2013 to 2016, uh, together with Magdalena Droste, um, which was funded by the DFG, the German Research uh, Foundation, and then also the research project on German magazines um, on, the period, on the Weimar period, which is also um, at least accessible online uh, to a certain extent. Again, a very important contribution to all of the scholars that are interested in German magazines of the, of the Weimar period. Um, he received um, a lot of um, awards and also scholarly recognition. And uh, specifically for the centenary, he contributed um, with a couple of exhibitions as well as publications on Bauhaus women. So uh, together um, with Elisabeth Otto, there appeared a couple of books as well as um, a book on um, Bauhaus bodies where he also contributed. So. Um, um, he's uh, constantly researching on Bauhaus. He's really a Bauhaus scholar among also our, our round. Um, so we thought we uh, sort of um, continue in the procedure like we did in the other panels that the two additional panelists um, uh, introduce but more their own institution and uh, sort of their particular relationship to the topic. We are engaging with this panel discussion, visibility of the global. And I would like to hand over the mic, first of all, uh, to Fabienne um, and invite her to give us a short insight into your uh, sort of uh, research and your curatorial activities in the Centrum Paul Klee. Yeah. Thank you for the introduction. So the Centrum Paul Klee is a pretty young institution. We opened in 2005. Uh, we have the largest Claire collection worldwide, about uh, 4,000 works. Claire made 10,000 works. But we also have a huge archive, so all the letters, biographical photographs, his library, um, and his teaching notes are in our archive. Uh, so we organize not only clay exhibitions, we surely always have one clay exhibition, but in the other exhibition space, uh, we organize all kinds of different exhibitions that relate in some way to clay. So that can be a contemporary uh, artist of clay or uh, also a group show with contemporary art or a thematic show as the Bauhaus Imaginista that we are showing now and which has, initi has been initiated by the Bauhaus Cooperation Weimar, Berlin and Dessau and curated uh, by Marion von Osten and Grant Watson. So that is one part. Um, we do also have uh, have been donated teaching notes, uh, no, notes by students of Klee, like Lena Bergner or Helene Nonne. So that was very interesting for us to see what has Klee really taught, uh, because we have around 3,900 teaching notes in our archive. 
and um, they have been in boxes in our vault and I always thought, oh my God, must be very interesting, but how, how can I get and look at all of these. So I found a colleague, uh, Marian uh, Keller, with whom I did a four-year research project, which culminated in this database. So all the teaching notes are as facsimile transcriptions on a database online. Uh, you can search uh, every word you want. Um, it's a long time ago, so eight years, and if you look at this database today, it looks very old-fashioned. And I think that's one question also, how do we activate or open our archives? And uh, we are currently really uh, trying to find new ways how we can make the, the information, the stories in our archive uh, accessible to a wider public. Because everything is digitized, we have a wonderful database with all the clay works, but that's interesting for researchers who know what they are looking for. But how, how can we open the archives um, yeah, for, for other people who would just like to, be, to have some information, some stories? And I think that's our next challenge where we are now. Patrick Rösser, I've forgotten one quite important publication that's quite an old one, but I think the Bauer's communication was such an important contribution uh, that it really refers to the whole research on the way how um, public media culture has shaped and influenced an institution that was constantly under crisis. Uh, and so far, I think this uh, I had to mention before I hand over the speech to you, Patrick Rösser, to give us some insights from your research perspective on the topic we are trying to discuss this afternoon. Yes, thank you very much and also thank you for chairing this session, thank you for this nice introduction and thank you to the organizers of this conference. Um, actually there was a lot, of go a lot going on this year but I think this conference really adds some new evidence and a new perspective on the celebrations this year so thank you again for bringing uh, together these people here in the room. So. <laughs> So Fabienne, I can follow up perfectly to what you said. Um, I love um, analog objects and I use them for my exhibition because I think the authenticity of the, um, of the object um, uh, is necessary um, if we want to convey our messages to, to the audience. Having said this, um, I'm sitting here because I'm also um, contributing some ideas on um, a perspective which was little, um, uh, almost neglected um, um, uh, here at this conference, and it's a huge challenge, and you mentioned it, this is how we get the transfer to the digital world. Um, it is obvious, um, the future generations, and then I'm talking about my daughters, for instance, they grow up in a world different from our world, and they are just used to certain practices, and we have to adopt those practices. And they, will, they go beyond setting up a database and making things researchable, which is an important first step, but it's only a first step. And this year, um, our pro research project, and you mentioned um, this research project, um, it contributed um, that in the during the, the event in Berlin, um, the Berlin Bauhaus Week we had in, in, in September, um, we opened for the public um, uh, the, this database, um, um, which is available um, on the internet free for everybody, where we put together information on all people related to the Bauhaus, so-called in German Bauhäusler, um, that um, we could find meaning. This roughly 1,250 students, more or less, um, and on top of them, of course, the people teaching at the Bauhaus and all those people who are somehow related to the Bauhaus. In the first place, this was a tool for our research project because from this research project, we were able to um, distillate the networks of the 1930s. But we decided to make this open to the public um, because, of course, we have information on, um, on almost all of the people we, um, we could find um, related um, to the Bauhaus, of course, with references to the literature. And, and this is important, the entries are like it's um, uh, it used to be done in a database, they are standardized. 
And so in the next step, we were able to compute statistical calculations based on these data, which are, of course, easy, accessible then for statistical procedures and so on. So as a starting point for um, um, something I call um, an institutional description of, um, of the Bauhaus over the course of the years. For all art historians here in the room, this is absolutely boring. I accept this, but um, still we have to deal with the Bauhaus as an institution and um, many of um, uh, its merits, um, they come from the fact that it was an institution and able for 12, 13, 14 years to build on this uh, background, this institutional background. And so I think that this um, could be a starting point and it also could be a starting point for the future because this data resource um, opens not just one artist like Paul Clay in depth like you do it, but it opens a broad range and it could be something like a portal for other additional um, uh, things. So if people search for something and look for something, they have a starting point and very often names are starting points. But you can access our database not only via the names, we also have um, the geolocations, um, so you, we have places you can research, you have um, certain time frames you can research, you can research um, single workshops um, of, of the powers and so on. So if you're interested, then um, you can look this um, up. And the second point I would like to mention, this was a second project um, I was involved in this year. Um, has to do also with the digital world, but um, it is more, um, obtrusive, as we call it. It's more in um, uh, also entering um, your world because it's the virtual reality representation um, of certain facts. We started, had a wonderful start this year of, um, um, of, this, um, of this year here in, uh, in Berlin um, with a Totales Tanztheater. I'm not sure whether you saw this, which was a um, virtual reality installation, an artistic um, representation, of course. We went a different way. We uh, developed a virtual reality representation of an exhibition from 1931 realized by Herbert Bayer, Laszlo Holinoc, and Xandi Schawinski based on a floor plan of Walter Gropius. And it was on occasion of the Deutsche Bauausstellung, German building exhibition, and it was the hall of the, of the building union workers. And uh, uh, Herbert Bayer, he developed um, a very special language of information science for this, especially for this um, hall, and this is one of the, I think, um, as we call it in German, Urknall, one of the, the, the big events, first events, where we have a certain type of information graphics, and they were huge, and the people back then, they knew what they were doing, that is, was important because they hired a photographer who took 80 photo, uh, photos of this hall from almost all different angles. And so we were able to use these photographs to reconstruct this as a virtual reality world where we actually can walk into. So we can walk um, into this hall and you can see the exhibits, of course, in black and white because we were not coloring them. We had only black and white photos. So it's a black and white world, but still it's some kind of time machine experience where you are really transferred into the back. And I'm mentioning this because um, with regard to events um, in the past, it's rather problematic because this is a special case. We have really 80 photos and we can construct this, this world. But we also have a follow-up project now where we will um, develop um, room models for existing institutions. And in the future, these institutions will be able to document their exhibitions, what they are doing now, in a virtual world and in a virtual museum where you can walk in, not like you have it sometimes on, on the internet, you have a, a video, 360 degrees video, you have the actual a, a room experience. And the topic, our, our topic here is methods and it's the global. And I think in, in times when everybody is discussing about traveling from A to B and the problems coming with it, um, and if we um, consider the enormous amount of work and money that goes into local exhibitions, maybe in China, and, and, and no one um, or a few people can, can actually see it. And even if 100,000 people are seeing your exhibition, which is a lot, it's still only a few people regarding um, the audience we, we have in, in the world. I truly believe that um, documenting um, high-level exhibitions 
in a virtual reality environment will be one of the methods in the future and we, where we can achieve what is the topic of our um, um, of our panel here a worldwide accessible um, uh, you know, notion of in this case the Bauhaus of course it's not restricted to the Bauhaus but the Bauhaus is um, the case where we develop the prototype from. Thank you very much, Patrick Rosso. Probably before we sort of start to um, try to combine these two positions, I would like to get back to you both, uh, your sort of uh, introductory lectures to the panel, because what I found interesting, if you try to find a common thread between you, your both presentations, that is, um, there is seemingly something with the Bauhaus that made it easy to travel. So it's seemingly light white, meaning there's this complicated term of a universal language that could be translated into the anonymity, <laughs> as you very nicely investigated, uh, Zoe. Um, and in your case, Isabel, it's about um, a seemingly adaptable into various different constellations um, teaching method. So I was wondering, um, how would you describe this ambiguity of that translatability, adaptability uh, of that uh, sort of um, different positions that are related actually to the Bauhaus history before we are discussing later on how this might be interlinked with uh, the discourses on the new media culture, meaning the digital. So what, how would you, if you have to extrapolate this, this, this moment of this universality uh, and its complications, how would you describe this, Zoe, if I may? You can talk this one. Okay. okay. Um, actually, uh, I just uh, discussed uh, with uh, my co-panelist <laughs> about uh, if there uh, there was a connection between um, Bauhaus in China and uh, Bauhaus in Australia. Uh, unfortunately, uh, until now we haven't found any connection, but uh, there um, might be a possibility that, as I mentioned. Um, uh, the dye ward, uh, the, the factory, they sold uh, the furniture uh, abroad uh, to the uh, east, the south of Asia, maybe go to uh, uh, Australia. Um, but uh, actually, this is uh, only a case study um, of the objects, um, because the, the theme is collecting Bauhaus. Uh, on the other hand, um, the Bauhaus ideas, uh, the ped pedagogical uh, model uh, was um, influenced and introduced uh, in China, too. I think um, it's um, the both sides of a coin, um, the materialist way and the um, intellectual ways. So uh, that put, um, made the Bauhaus so uh, easy traveling um, to so far uh, from the Germany, China. Actually, we also always mentioned the uh, Silk Road. Uh, China is the one end, and Germany is the other end. So um, I'm very uh, delighted to um, see so many researchers that connected gradually this road, um, how the Chinese, uh, how the Bauhaus ideas from Germany and um, through the West Asia and to China. It's very interesting uh, for us. But actually, um, the widespread of the Chinese, uh, of the Bauhaus ideas in China uh, was in uh, 1980s after the, you know, the reform of China. Um, but I think the uh, commercial way is uh, as important as uh, the intellectual way, yeah. Yeah, actually, I talked with a colleague from India yesterday about this. It seems like the further you get away from Europe, the more art education becomes becomes a method, uh, which of course has is not just only uh, art, teaching art in a particular way, but also overcoming kind of uh, Western domination, because it's really not kind of the strict training, but it's oh, just give everyone the materials and let them explore, so really kind of also working on the individual. Uh, material, ex material studies is very important. That's something where Albers and Hirschfeld-Mack very closely corresponded about this. 
Uh, that's really kind of one of the main methods. Also, you can do it under any conditions. You can collect whatever material you just have at hand and let everyone uh, have free access to it and just explore. And Hirschfeldmark really went on to really develop this from small kindergarten children, middle school, uh, and then secondary school. And of course, the other dimension to this is that if modernism is not something uh, which really fits into mainstream culture, which is mostly the case the further you get away from Europe, uh, then if you invest in the next generation and if they, they really kind of appreciate modernism, this is how you get it across. I mean, that's basically the same how also in California certain people approached modernism where it was, I mean, totally conservative art scene. And it's the same in Australia and other places that you basically you invest in the next generation. Uh, and we see this, basically the young guys uh, really coming out of college, they try to find the old guys and they tell us what is there. And so really when, when they could go and see Hirschfeld Max, they form a color uh, court orchestra and just kind of do all this stuff. So it's really kind of also an intergenerational connection. So it's on the one side kind of going beyond the societal structures in educational cultural terms and on the other hand really kind of working very explicitly with the next generation. Um, yeah, I, uh, I think it's as Fernando said it earlier, it's migration of persons, it's migration of ideas, of concepts, and I think the Bauhaus is probably a good example um, because it's a very uh, open process orientated school uh, which did not say how, what they have to do but how to approach uh, a new approach. And I think that was also well received everywhere and the Bauhaus itself was not the starting point because there were a lot of ideas migrating to the Bauhaus as the Bauhaus Imaginista research project shows very well. It's not, it's really a, 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 not a story uh, from influence, the Bauhaus influences uh, all over the world, but also how the Bauhaus itself uh, had ideas and inspirations from everywhere. And I think it's this vice versa um, stories that happen all the time that are interesting uh, to follow. Right. I mean, it depends on how we're going to try to frame it or render it, what kind of concepts we apply to. I mean, I always think probably this process of translation. Mm -hmm. um, where always something new comes in, uh, like Benjamin, for example, has described it. You know, so it's a constant process of, of translation uh, and and a new sort of a new language uh, sort of appears. I think this is with the color color theory the same. The way it's been taught is with the way how in Shanghai this company um, sort of integrated uh, sort of tubular steel. But I think what is also probably and that would be interesting, and that's why I would like to get back to this uh, sort of tricky question of the universal, um, uh, this universal language is um, something get also lost in the process of translation um, and, and the, 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 the path uh, through migration. And uh, I was wondering, um, because when you think, for example, about his argument that Breuer brought in with the African chair, and then you end up, this is one of the Gegenstand of the Bausi Magista, and you end up um, with the lady sitting on the column of air. So there is a dialogue between something that got completely lost in this process of that the company in, in China uh, sort of now translated into something else. And I think the same applies to Hirschfeld Max's teaching um, when he, in a way, um, excerpt only, you know, aspects of this very complex and contradictive uh, pedagogical models. And this leads me probably to the question of the digital you brought in. Um, because of, as you already uh, sort of discussed, um, Fabienne, um, when we come to this uh, sort of um, a kind of another historiography we might need, and the Bauhaus is only one example, uh, to open up and to widen, moving away from the linear, rather than into a more spatial and tangled historiography of uh, actually um, the Bauhaus in its various echoes and resonances. Um, to what extent does specifically the tool of the digital offers us also new media for specifically a sort of, um, um, yeah, sort of widening the horizon and also a tool for another historiography? So just to, to yeah. yeah. I think it's, a, um, you have good tools to show a network uh, to not tell the story in a linear way, but things happening at the same time. 
and you can always pop pop something up if you are interested. You can also choose. It's not we don't tell you the whole story, but the user can choose which story he or she wants to see. So I think it's a nice way um, to give the opportunity to have the information, but not to tell in one story because each user can can choose the story he or she wants to hear. And um, we decided that um, one outcome of our project will be a publication which um, would be pretty unusual. It will consist of 16 folded um, A0 maps where we are trying to um, put down the evidence we collect from our database and the networks where we try to show them graphically. And not only just in those um, um, regional networks, but we also have individual networks, we have time-based networks, we have movements, different time sections. But the big challenge um, with this is that usually we are not trained for doing this. So we are working together with um, information designers who have special education in information design and who are able to transfer this information actually into visuals. Um, and this is a very, very different task. It's a, it's a challenge for us. So we can provide the data and we can take care of that the data is correct. But um, the next step and the implementation, there we need um, other people to do this for us. Either it be, pr be printed or it be um, generated online. These networks can also be generated online. So for instance, you enter a name and then you get to display the network of this person um, live um, and interactively on your computer. But then you need a person who is uh, able to take care of the screen design, which is not an easy, an easy task. And this is um, uh, now this is the front line where we are fighting right at, at the moment. So we have the data, but um, we have to get it across in a way which is um, appropriate for the 21st century, which was one of your introductory words. So how do we transfer this to the 21st century? And I guess the other one would be visual readability. Because, I mean, we talked about this before. I mean, how do we enable then also the audience that they can really read this in different ways, see the hierarchies which are in there? And I think that's quite a challenge. I mean, the doing the database is the one thing yeah, and getting the money for it and everything. Yeah. But then really, we are also kind of proud that everyone can play around and basically yeah. do whatever. But of course, there is also certain methods that you can make sense out of it. Uh, and this is something where I think we need much more in terms of educational terms. This needs to be much more kind of visual methods uh, in terms of readability. This is something that the students need. Um, we need this kind of education for us, but not for the generations, for the next generations. No, I still think that they need to kind of, in, in, in terms of, I mean, they, they know kind of how to maneuver easily through everything, uh, but in terms of, it's like close reading. It, it, it's more than just kind of doing the technical things. Uh, that I definitely see. I mean, because as always, you just play around and that's fine, but it's totally coincidental by those structures. I mean, there is visual readability and there is a methodology to this. And I think that has to be taught. Otherwise, it's just kind of, yeah, everyone takes something, but it comes totally coincidental. I mean, it's not that it leads to any kind okay. of, that, that there is an increase in any kind of knowledge formation, I would say. But if I may just to intervene, and then I hand over the, uh, the, the questions to the audience. And the last question is also that um, when we are talking about the creation of those kind of database, they are mostly based, again, on a very expert knowledge of the archives. And this then goes back to the problematics of the archives, because the archives are formed under particular conditions with particular standards, very much shaped also by a certain Western conception of how we conceive material heritage. So I was wondering to what extent do we in a way double the problematics of the archives within also the databases? Um, this is more pro provocative question, but to, or how do we could reframe that, that there is a lack of, I mean, certain sorts of knowing, modes of knowing, they do not have access neither to these archives nor mm -hmm. to the database. What do you think? I don't think that we should discuss this here, but I want to mention it because it's important. This is the copyright issue. So, um, the same problems we have with using things and materials from archives right now in the present way, um, they problems, they get 
uh, at least double if we go to the internet and to online pu publication. So there needs um, to be a, a big. Um, uh, we have to resolve this problem, and we have this uh, resolve this problem in a, in a global scale to make things accessible um, to, to to audiences. And if we are not able to resolve this, I think many of the initiatives we uh, initiatives we are taking um, they go into nowhere because um, in the end we cannot publish our our stuff and so i think this is, would be one precondition um for um getting into this um more deeper but this is part of the problem of the standards of the archive in a way mm -hmm. no? so yeah please uh, yeah. Fabienne. so um to come back to your question um as i said to have this database it's nice uh, but it's not enough so i think um we really have to know which story we would like to tell. So, um, for instance, when we prepare an exhibition uh, about class uh, trips, uh, so we have a lot of materials in our archive and we can display it in the showcase. Uh, most of the people won't read it or will not be able to read it because it's, uh, we transcribe it, etc. but still. So we try to convert this information into kind of digitorial so that the visitor before uh, or after the visit, he or she can scroll down, listen also, see movies. So it's really a combination of, of reading, images, listening. Uh, so that's, it's, it's a light form to digest um, these informations because if I just display it in the showcases, it, it won't have the same effect. Uh, so that's one thing. And the other thing we also um, heard today, activate the archive. I mean, that's another thing we would like to, we are currently uh, trying to find funds to have a fellowship so that we can in, invite artists, scholars, musicians, writers to come to our archive, to work in our archive and to make something with the archive, so to activate it. I think that's another way uh, beside the digital way. So the floor is yours, please. Are there any questions uh, in the audience uh, to the panelists? So it's again very hard to see. Are there any? Please, Eva, <laughs> first of all. Thank you. I, I think that uh, Patrick Rosler touched a nerve with the issue of um, copyrights and, and publication rights. And I wonder if you have any closer or more concrete idea about how it could happen internationally. So how can you overcome the duality of getting a publishable uh, quality of a photo plus the copyright and how, how it could be internationally arranged? You want a simple solution? I would very much like to. You rent a server on the Cayman Islands and you just don't care. <laughs> Uh, I'm obviously, sorry, I didn't this think is about not the, it. Uh, obviously, this is not the solution. I was just, I this was joking. Okay. Yeah. okay. Um, actually, I believe um, that um, if we are, will be able in the future to solve this problem, will be um, just a collateral damage um, of discussions, which will be um, pursued on a completely different level. Um, on a level and where we have to admit that us as art historians um, or communication science, we are so unimportant related to the things at stake in, in, in these matters. There we are talking about um, large, big, big players who have um, acquired in the past visual rights and archival rights of um, who have bought together archives during the past 10 or 20 years. We have um, big publishers, companies who are still producing media and we are talking about the moving image uh, topic related to the vows. It's not so important, but um, these are the areas where these discussions on copyright, where, um, where we find these discussions. And um, uh, I have to assume that we will not be able to be a voice that is heard in, in this discussion. This is pessimistic, um, I know, and I'm sorry that I cannot offer you a different solution rather than the Cayman Islands, but, um, uh, but I think this is uh, just realistic, what I'm telling you. Yeah, I'm, I'm sorry, I have no I just, better response. Uh, I just um, comment, because uh, in our museum, actually we are planning a project. Uh, it's the uh, International Design Archives and Libraries. 
And you know, uh, according to my research in China, we have different law about copyright, so, um, but um, we have the same problem um, to make our um, the data, mm, uh, the digital data, how. Uh, international, but it's maybe I think it's no problem uh, domestic. <laughs> um, so um, uh, we are trying to find a way. Um, uh, maybe some uh, some data, uh, some pictures archives have such problems. We will um, um, limit the right to for accessible. Uh, you can uh, view those uh, photos only in our museum, but we uh, are planning to put an uh, iPad or something else, the, the equipment, together with the objects in the exhibition. Because I think the digital um, method is uh, one of the um, uh, diversity of perspectives. So uh, it can be um, together with objects with uh, uh, different perspectives to uh, understand uh, the design. Um, that's the way, that's our um, belief uh, to curate every exhibition to give the diversity of per, uh, perspectives. Actually, I think that's very important also from my perspective to really keep uh, the digital and the analog world together. Mm -hmm. uh, and not because the next generation anyhow is only searching in the in the internet. I, I take museum uh, students to a museum every week. I do a museums class, actually I do two museums classes. And for the last seven years, it has happened to me that the students then the first time we go and look at a late medieval altar panel or whatever, they stand in front there and say, wow, is this real? Because I mean, their world is the digital world and they are actually really thankful but they would never have the idea that there is this analog world and so I think it's quite important to actually expose them to this yeah. uh, and to see the texture and the size and the context and of course I mean it will always have to be a mixture of course they are living in their own world but I think it's important and not that we just say oh they anyhow only are doing things in a digital world so forget the rest and put everything online uh, I think it is exactly important to keep those two dimensions together and I basically experience is every semester. Uh, and the funny thing is in the old times, students would say, oh, my parents dragged me to museums. But now it's just the opposite. It's like, wow, this is really exciting. Yeah. Other questions from the, yeah, please. There's a lot of thoughts that cross my mind with this. I, I mean, I've been wrestling with this since at least 1991, when uh, books that we published in the United States uh, end up on university uh, intranet databases. So the students don't have to buy the books, they just log in and see our material uh, on their free university websites. Um, I mean, this was the beginning of the downfall of publishing in the United States, you know, the culmination of which is Amazon, which is totally unaccountable. And I think one lesson we've learned from this is that the answer is to somehow take back ownership of what you are making. I mean, if you're making a, a, an interactive virtual reality world or space or, you know, that's also educational, then you have to consider yourself the composer and the owner of, of that and every element in it. Um, that is, if you want the rights to, to own the rights to a picture, you take the picture. Uh, or you pay a photographer very well for all the rights uh, of, of taking that picture. Um, um, I, I'm not sure where this is going other than, other than to, to, I mean, to, 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 to create something that's, a, you know, that's, that's going to be available to everyone for free forever, you know, pay the people who make it. <laughs> yeah, but I think uh, you may be also uh, talking as a private person. We are a public funded institution, so the taxpayers uh, fund us. Right. So we want to give something back. Uh, but of course, we are paid for our job. But then once it's, it's done, it's like it's public well, domain. People should be able to use it for free. Yeah, and he's talking about hiring information designers and uh, Sure, you know, I'm not sure what that is today, but you know, it's a contractor. 
But I, I guess that's, uh, the, the big idea here is that, is that you own the technology, that you own the means of production, I guess, as you know, Marx would have said. Um, and you know, if you're going to give it away, if you're a government, then you, know, you, you make sure you, you own it and that, and that the workers who produce this thing are, are adequately paid. Mm -hmm. And I mean, this is so interesting to jump in because um, the underlying sort of uh, probably question you have is we should not conceive even those digital means as neutral or innocent rather than as you already started to describe. And I think this tr we can trace back to the to the Diawad company and the way how, I mean, there was, a, I mean, in the very beginning, there was a the trouble about authorship, certainly also at the Bauhaus. A couple of scholarly books are, uh, sort of have, have explored it intensively, uh, how specifically Marcel Breuer was, was struggling, or Herbert Bayer, same, no? uh, how they were struggling to, to be uh, accepted and recognized as authors in a time in which mass production and prototyping, serial production was already at work. And this is a kind of a contest field um, of discussion and it continues in the question of copyrights. No? So I think this is a continuous line and this is this kind of dialectics um, but we have to be very aware also about I mean, the, the problematics that are behind the, the tools that might probably so help for a certain opening up and widening and uh, sort of um, multiplication of narratives uh, in regard to historiography but at the same time they are sitting in a particular culture and uh, you know of, of 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 information capitalism if you want to and that is also important to take into consideration yeah yeah and I guess you can't do national solutions anymore. This, I think, is the yes. next couple yes. that you basically is not that you can uh, basically curb it on a national level, and it, it goes beyond. And I think that is exactly the point where now everything is really up in the open. Um, yeah, I would also have a question following up on uh, the uh, issue of digital, the digital, and uh, the notion of, of property. Um, because with if you have a database sort of on top of a physical archive, then in I would say that the problem of of copyright is sort of doubled because obviously you have the items with the specific um, copyright issues linked to each of them, but you also have like an infrastructure that the database is running on that most of the times is, is private. Um, and I was involved in um, a digitization project where we tried to have the the software um, sort of made available as an as um, an open source, and our contractor basically told us, yeah, but then the fee would be like three times uh, as much. So uh, now we're sort of in the situation that every time that we need to do the, have them do like two or three clicks on the program, it costs, I don't know, like 800 euros for an IT person to like fire up the laptop. Um, and I wondered whether that was something that um, you also, for the digitization project that you have been uh, working on, sort of took into consideration um, that you sort of maintained the control of the infrastructure that um, the database is running on. Yeah, so I did the same mistake uh, when we made the database with class teaching notes. We were working with a publishing house and they said, oh no, we don't, don't do books with CD or DVD anymore. Because for me it was clear we can't do a book with 3,900 um, um, pages. And then said, yeah, no, it's very fashionable. We do this database. And I said, yeah, sure, that looks great. And now the firm that is running the database um, is, uh, got, got, how do you say, concourse skin? Yeah, bankrupt. Bankrupt. Mm -hmm. <laughs> OK. So the publishing house called me like, oh, they are bankrupt. What do you want to do? And so we could migrate it, but we can't change anything. And that was the selling point. Like, you know, it's flexible. If you find another teaching note, you can always uh, upload it, etc. So, and I think that's the, that's the problematic. How do we keep, if we make such databases or, or other programs, how do we keep, keep them up to date? Not only in an aesthetic way, but also in a technical way. And I, I don't have the 
solution for that. It's not my solution. So uh, we, we have to work closely or more closely with people uh, who, who are really in this field. But as you said, then you have to pay, you know, how much that costs. Yeah. In our case, we were able to learn from experiences like you had. Um, um, our proposal included from the beginning um, that we would hire two persons um, developing this based on open source um, 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 program code. And so what we actually have is open source PHP and so on, so you, you can very easily work with this uh, data and it's exportable, everything. We face a completely different um, problem. As this was only a research project, um, we um, have to take care of um, that, the, um, that the database is maintained in the future. And obviously, you're an institution. You can secure this um, um, better than we um, can. In our case, we have the opportunity to do this because we we have um, um, everything we need. But um, of course, we need uh, further support. And there, we are of course discussing um, with the uh, relevant institutions how we can achieve this for the future. So we have one last question. Ah, yeah, then Jan Janet Rudensik. Yes. <laughs> There are two. And we, we do we have time for two questions? Florian? Two yes. Questions. Okay. <laughs> okay. Okay, I'm sorry. My question is uh, to Isabel about her presentation about uh, Ludwig Hirschfeld Mack. Yeah. Uh, do you know anything about his maybe practical implementation of color studies? Because as far as I got it, he was more into teaching than into implementing in practice. I ask this uh, because of my personal research about Hinak Shepa, who was first year student and who maybe had some relation to Hirschfeld Monk and who got into practical implementation. It was yeah. a main focus at the Bauhaus. Later on, he really focused much more on material studies. Uh, but it was always kind of, I mean, color theory was a foundation of when he taught painting classes or so. So he used it more in a general term. And I guess we also have to keep in mind, I mean, when he came to Australia, he really worked on general school education. And it was really bringing art in a general school curriculum. So we're talking about an hour a week or something like this, but really that art education should be something of the general curriculum. And so it's on a very basic level. So it's not kind of as he as elaborated as, as of course it would have been in, in artist education, but as a foundation. Was it more like a visual alphabet that was launched? In no color contrasts mm -hmm. and, and with the circles and light and dark gradations gray, gray and those things. I also had a comment and kind of a question, but more of a comment as I've been listening to the panel. There are different registers of um, the interpretation of the Bauhaus as an historical entity through its archives, but also, and particularly through Isabel's talk, but also with Zoe, the Bauhaus idea as a, a living model and a living pedagogy and a living um, artistic force because I, I was uh, captured by the lantern projects that he did. And I thought a lot about the way that the Albers Foundation has dealt with this is like conquering the world one classroom at a time, that um, of it as a living pedagogy rather than just as a historical model. And the challenge that uh, that of course presents for every institution that works with this material. Schluss. <laughs> Fantastic final words. Thank you so much, <laughs> uh, Janet Rodensik, for this for this conclusion, so to speak. Uh, thank you. Thank you.